My name is Dave Bloom from uh, Milestones and Meanings and I'm very pleased to be interviewing Harris Green on his life story here today. And I hope Harris, this conversation will be a meaningful and enriching experience for you and indeed for your descendants who will be watching this sometime in the future. I hope they will gather uh, insight into your life and to what you've done in your life and your achievements and your thoughts about uh, uh, a number of different uh, subjects we, which we, we're going to discuss today. Look forward to it. Okay, well I guess the whole story begins on uh, February, 8th, February 28th, 1946, the day I was born. Um, I was born to uh, Sully and Marsha Green. Uh, my dad was uh, born in Cape Town in 1911. Uh, he was the fourth son of uh, my grandparents who'd come uh, from Poland to South Africa. My grandfather traveled via uh, Europe. He was a tailor in Leeds for a couple of years and uh, got to South Africa in 1902. My grandmother followed uh, in, she came directly to South Africa in uh, 1902. My dad was the fourth of six children. Uh, and uh, by the time he reached high school, um, things, the economic situation in South Africa was particularly bad. It was right in the middle of the Great Depression. Uh, he was forced to leave school at a, at a young age. Uh, he was 15 or 16 when he had to leave school because he needed to go out and supplement the, the family income. Initially, he worked as a delivery boy, uh, schlepping things, uh, or delivering orders, but on foot, uh, all, all over Cape Town. Um, my mom came from, uh, my mom was born in Poland. My mom came uh, to South Africa as an orphan in 1930. Her parents passed away both uh, when she was six years old, both of them within a couple of months of each other. Uh, my grandparents, my maternal grandparents, were were in their second marriages and uh, in total my mother had, had nine, my mother was the youngest of nine children, uh, five of them to the same set of parents and the others to either to the same father or to the same mother. Uh, the eldest uh, children remained in Poland and the assumption is that they died in the Holocaust because there was no, uh, you know, after the war there was uh, no, no uh, contact with them anymore. Uh, Mom and my mum's brothers, the, the sort of, you know, the full blood brothers, had come to South Africa, started coming to South Africa at a younger age. Um, and uh, what happened was, in, in sometime in 27 or 28, there was a fire in the village where they lived. The house was destroyed. And uh, these kids, three kids who were still left in, in Poland, uh, the ultimate idea, of course, was that they get to South Africa eventually that these kids were then left homeless, they were taken in by cousins. They wrote to the family in South Africa explaining about the catastrophe. Uh, the family in South Africa did their utmost to raise money and charity and sorts of things to get those three youngsters from <coughs> Europe to, uh, to South Africa. And uh, ultimately they were successful. In many respects this fire, which at the time must have been extremely traumatic for the family, in actual fact, it was a, it was a, a lifesaver because uh, my mother ultimately reached South Africa on the second last ship that, uh, that was allowed into South Africa with Jewish immigrants from, uh, from Eastern Europe. So my mom arrived in South Africa in April 1930. The family at the time lived in a uh, hamlet near Worcester called Orchard. Um, Who was the family that she came to? She came to her older brothers who uh -huh. had a sort of string of grocery stores uh, around all these very small farming communities in that area, uh -huh. in the Hexa River Valley. And um, my mom uh, was basically, she was the youngest of, the, of all the children. She was the only one in the entire family that actually went to school. Uh, she came to South Africa at the age of 10 and although her brothers and sister really cared for her, you know, she was, the, the reason why she went to school and in fact to boarding school was that this was, a, this was an environment for her and a framework for her because really she couldn't be at home and do, and do nothing. Uh, she went to school in Worcester and one of the stories that she always used to relate to me is that on Sundays when the parents of the kids used to come along 
uh, all her class friends and, and come and collect them, she was always the one that was left there on her own without, without parents and having to make her way back to this very small farming community uh, just outside Worcester. So uh, all in all, I think that uh, my mom had a, had a very difficult childhood, uh, having basically to grow up by herself, having to make friends with people that she didn't really have much in common with. But uh, nonetheless, I think that she, uh, you know, she stuck to her guns and uh, she too, by the time she reached uh, the age of 15 or 16, <coughs> she too had to leave school in order to provide uh, income for the, for the family. And uh, shortly after that, she left Orchard to come to Cape Town. In fact, all my mother's brothers uh, did that. And uh, there was just one who remained on there to actually continue the so-called empire. Uh, when my mom came to, to Cape Town, she started working as a, as a secretary. Uh, to get back to my dad, he was seized with the World War II in the, in the offing. Um, my dad joined the army, uh, and after going through a, some basic training in Pretoria, he then came back to Cape Town on a short vacation, uh, just before he was about to be sent up north. This was in early 1940. And while he was in Cape Town, one Sunday, it was a family tradition that the whole family used to go up the mountain, and they used to you know, have an icon on the way down. They would always sit at one particular spot, which was called the Gates of Heaven. They used to sit there and they used to make themselves tea and, and have an orange or whatever before carrying on the journey home to the family home where they all lived at the top of Orange Street in, in Cape Town. What happened was that when they sat down on this last Sunday before my dad went into the army, uh, they were sitting there, they got up to go, and then my grandfather just dropped dead from a heart attack. And uh, it was, it, my dad obviously wanted to sit shiva for the period of the week, and because he was due to go back to the army a couple of days later, they, they wouldn't allow him to do that. So after sitting shiva for two or three days, he had to go back to, to Pretoria, and then afterwards he carried on um, his army training, his army uh, action. What was interesting is that my grandfather, as a tailor, had made my father a lumber jacket uh, to keep him, you know, to, to, for him to take with. And uh, my dad took this lumber jacket at, and he kept a diary and a camera and all these things right throughout uh, World War II. He saw action in, uh, in East Africa and then later in Abyssinia, in Sudan. He was in Egypt and then in Libya. And then in Libya he was ultimately uh, injured. He was very seriously injured. He was uh, detonated by a minefield. Uh, he, he was in the engineers. He was given all this material to, uh, to uh, neutralize the minefield. But they had given him fast burning fuse instead of slow burning fuse. And as a result, of, he went up together with the minefield. And he was very seriously injured. He lost a lot of his fingers. He lost uh, his eyesight in one, in one eye. He didn't have it all. He just had sort of light sensitivity. The other eye he saw OK. His hearing was, was uh, badly impaired. But uh, you know, he was, and then he was hospitalized after his friends had actually left him there for dead for a period of, uh, he was left, you know, in the, in the desert, he was hospitalized in Egypt, and then afterwards he was uh, taken back to Cape Town. He was in the hospital there for a long time. He, I think he had uh, 19 operations in 11 months. Dad's friends in the army, they picked up this, um, they picked up the number jacket, the diary, and the camera. And, uh, but these friends of his later became, later were taken prisoners of war. And in 1945, after the, at the end of the war, they were released, they came back to Cape Town, and they visited my dad's eldest sister, together with the lumber jacket, the camera, and the diary. And uh, they had understood that uh, my dad was actually killed, that he was killed. They didn't know. And uh, they came back to Cape Town, and uh, on what sort of started out as a kind of post seven day shiver call, uh, actually ended up in them finding out that my dad had, you know, recovered from all of this. He'd gone back to, uh, he'd, you know, he'd gone back to work. He'd been able to, he'd, uh, he'd met my mom. They got married, and uh, they, in fact, uh, my mom was pregnant, and that was with me on the way. So that was really the time that I was born into. World War II, I think, for us in the family, was always a very 
It was a central part of the family history. Everything was related to the war. That was the, the anchor event. Everything was either before the war, during the war. Okay, now the time that I was uh, born, I was really born into a family without grandparents, without, uh, without uh, you know, I was the eldest child. My brother came along four years afterwards. Um, I was born to, to parents who didn't really uh, have any sort of inheritance. They were, I think they were both very simple people, but, and uh, they were people who, for us, uh, for my brother and I, we were really the only things that they, that they had and, and whatever, whatever they were able to, they really invested in us in terms of time, in terms of, of, of attention, in terms of, of helping to, to best develop the qualities that we had and the talents that we had. They were always there for that sort of thing and uh, yeah, I, uh, both my brother and I are really very much indebted to the to what they did for us. At the same time, I think they saw in us an opportunity to uh, to uh, actually uh, live out some of the dreams that they might have had as, as kids. And uh, I think that you know, for that, that was it was important to them. And in that respect, I really hope that uh, that what we've done uh, since has been uh, has been a credit to to what they wanted and what they would have liked for us. And uh, that to us has, has, has always been very important. Um, Can you describe the, the, the home in terms of, the, you, 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 obviously there was a strong Jewish uh, atmosphere in the home? There was strong Jewish uh, atmosphere in the home. My mom's, uh, my mom, although they always spoke English at home because my dad's Yiddish wasn't, uh, wasn't anything to, to write home about, but uh, my mom, with her brother, certainly used to speak uh, Yiddish all the time. And uh, together with us, you know, we heard lots of Yiddish at home. Um, we, we were always uh, taught, you know, my, my parents regarded themselves as, as, as very Jewish, as traditional. They weren't particularly observant, but they, you know, the home was always kosher. They, uh, there was a special, you know, the whole idea of religion and everything was, was very much revered. And, uh, you know, we were taught to respect these things as, as younger children. Uh, just in the same way as the, my parents had uh, only the basic uh, formal education, so too their Jewish education was things that they picked up from their homes. And my mom, perhaps because she was a, a, an orphan and being in a boarding school, she was actually denied a lot of the things that uh, other kids of, of her age would have absorbed. And, you know, she didn't have that opportunity. So she was. She didn't have too much of that, and and uh, my dad too. I think at that time, you know, the the, the parents were, were very worked very very hard, um, and and so I, therefore I think it was a lot more difficult for them to to actually to impart something meaningful, and uh, or meaningful yes from an emotional point of view, but less so from a from a philosophical point of view and from an intellectual point of view. I think the the. Their religion was more a, uh, a sort of an identification with the community. The communication, the community meant a lot to them, and um, and that's that was their connection really with uh, with uh, with Yiddish guy. The friends, obviously, their friends were, were Jewish, and we were always in, encouraged. Was I was sent to a, a kindergarten where where all my friends and everything were were, were all Jewish and. Uh, and uh, therefore, you know, the, the neighborhood was also had a, had a very high percentage of Jewish people living there. And as a result, that's, uh, that was why Jewish people or the, the Jewish community really formed the backbone of my, uh, of my social uh, circle. Can you describe the, the neighborhood where which part of Cape Town? Initially, uh, my parents uh, had this uh, small apartment in uh, Warren Street, which is in Tambos Kloof in the upper part of Cape Town. Uh, they were there for a, a year. I think I was, as far as I know, I was born there. And then afterwards, they moved to a slightly bigger apartment just around the corner to Camden Street. We were there for a couple of years. And then when my mum fell pregnant for the second time, um, they decided to move out to the southern suburbs to Kenilworth. And uh, we got there in 1949. My brother was born in uh, March 1950. And uh, that's really, I, I have very, very few memories of, of having lived in Cape Town. But I must admit that despite the fact that we lived in, in small apartments, that, you know, that basically we had the basics, not more than that, as a child, I never felt that I was lacking in anything. 
I was always given everything and uh, was given enormous amounts of time by my parents. And, uh, and my dad uh, was very, very much into sport. He introduced every conceivable sport to us as, as kids. And what was important to him wasn't just the idea of competing in order to win. The idea was, my dad had the saying that in order to learn how to win, you first have to know how to lose. And uh, you need lots of practice at that. And uh, that, was, that was a lesson that I took with me. He, he really taught me as a, as a youngster that participation, participating in any event was, was something special. Uh, my mom uh, was a housewife, she, did, she didn't work. But uh, what she used to do was she used to come to, um, it wasn't enough for her just giving her son the sandwich to come to go to school in the, in the, in the morning. Uh, I used to get my sandwich for, this, for the short break at 11, but at quarter to one, my mother always used to pitch up at school, and I had to get out to the, to the corner of the street, and I would get a hot drink, and I would get something more to eat, uh, much more than any of the other kids got. And uh, the truth of the matter is that at the time, it, I was really embarrassed by all of this. I was, you know, my friends used to call me a mommy's boy and everything, but I must admit that as, as I got older, I began to, to appreciate what quality time meant and uh, it, it was very important to me when I was bringing up my own kids to be involved with them, to have these quality moments with them so that we could you know, talk about things and we could strengthen the bonds between us. It was very, very important and uh, they certainly taught me, both of them, they taught me a lot in that respect. My dad was, was always at school, you know, he would come to school to watch us participate in the sporting events. In fact, I remember one particular event, and my dad was a swimmer, and he was a very keen swimmer. And uh, he also coached swimming. And uh, as kids, we were, we were members of the Union Swimming Club in Cape Town. And one year, I, was, uh, I had tried to register for a particular prestigious event. I was about nine or 10 years old, and there was a, a, um, an under 13 competition swimming swimming event which was called which was called champions in the making uh, it was part of the gordon's gala and it was well known to the whole swimming fraternity in cape town i was invited i, I came along and i registered for the event but they i wasn't accepted because my uh, i didn't have the history i didn't have the track record for it but on the night of the event one of the uh, kids who had been accepted it didn't didn't show up for whatever reason and i saw that there was an empty lane I went up to the organizers and I said that I'd registered for the event and it's because there was an empty lane, would they allow me to swim? And uh, they said yes. So I swam and this was a 100 yard race, three lengths of the old long speed boats in Cape Town. And I remember that when I turned into my third length, the, the, uh, the winners had already, they were already finished the race. And I came in, must have been at least, uh, I don't know, 20, 25 seconds after everybody else. And when I was getting out the water, my dad was there to help me out the water, gave me a big hug, and uh, told me how, how proud he was of me. And uh, that, that, that's an event that I won't forget in a hurry. It was, uh, that it was so typical of the values and the love for sport that he was able to, uh, to impart in, in us. Besides sport, what other extramural activities did you do? Well, uh, my parents, I think, thought that I was a great student, that I had lots and lots of talent. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a scholar, I was pretty good. But uh, yeah, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't uh, if anything, I probably underperformed. I don't think I was particularly industrious as a, as a pupil. Uh, but uh, I was involved in all the other activities at school. Uh, friends were always a big part of my life. And, um, uh, we had, yeah, I've made my, my childhood friends in, in, the, in the neighborhood in which we lived. Uh, Howard Kaplan and Asher Abbotts, they were, lived in the same block of flats as we did and Howard lived across the road. We, we became, and we still are to this day, very close friends, although Howard's in South Africa, Asher's in Australia. Uh, we're in contact all the time, we talk regularly. Um, I also should mention my brother, my brother because in addition to him being my brother, he's also, I also regard him as a very close friend. He's, uh, my brother's living in Israel today. We talk to each other regularly. Um, in many respects, we, we're very, very different, but we're also very, very similar. I think that uh, our parents 
who made their impressions on us in their own way. We were all, he, he together with me shared this, uh, this experience. And as I always say, we ate out of the same plate, we, uh, we drank out of the same bottle, and we even uh, went to the same toilets. But we were, we've always been very, very close. We, we've enjoyed the, we enjoyed the same experiences and our values are similar. And it's, uh, it's interesting that the, the last telephone call that I get before candle lighting on Friday afternoon is always from my brother to wish me Shabbat Shalom. And uh, the same thing on Saturday night, the first call I get is always from my brother to wish me Shabbat Shalom. We speak uh, almost every day and uh, we really are very close. And I think that uh, what we what we learned over the years that when it came to uh, to uh, having family responsibilities and responsibilities to each other and to our parents in their elder years when they were you know when they were were ill, the I think both of us accepted complete responsibility. It wasn't a question of having to apportion the load between the two of us. So that never it was never on the cards. I, I was always there, he was always there, we were always there for each other, and uh, it actually still carries on like that today. We, we're very close and uh, he's very special to me, and um, it's a wonderful relationship. So academically, what were your strengths? And, and what, I think that I, 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 I always liked uh, history and geography, and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, I, I found uh, anything to do with numbers I found easy. The things that I enjoyed less were the uh, nature study and, uh, and, science and physics and that sort of thing. I found less interesting, less challenging. Maybe I wasn't prepared to make the, the, uh, the effort to, uh, to study all that stuff. But um, it was uh, largely... Um, I was encouraged to read a lot. And uh, I think that through reading and uh, both books and newspapers and journals, um, I began to, to become aware of what was going on around me. And, uh, and as a result, I, you know, I kind of sought the value of life. And uh, you know, that the life, my life was given to me so that I could do something with it. So it was important to me for me to, to start formulating objectives and to work out ways in which to, to, to realize these. I think one of the things that, that was was particularly relevant in my growing up because everything sort of seemed to happen in very regulated stages. Um, and like I said, I was just uh, I was uh, just over three when we moved to Kenilworth, and that's really when my when more of the sort of the more more of the vivid memories begin. Uh, and uh, so I remember that's when I, I began nursery school. That's when I went to school. That's when I met my first friends. And then, uh, just before my bar mitzvah, we moved to a house in Newlands. Now, this was, my parents had been married 14 years, and this was the first tangible asset that they'd managed to, to, to you know, to get their hands on. And uh, that house for us was something special. It was more than just a house, it was really a home. And, uh, yeah, my brother was a couple of years younger than me, but uh, that sort of brought us into a different neighborhood. The, the, the friends that we were able to, to carry with us from the previous place came with us, but we also met, uh, was also exposed to new circles of, of friends, it was just before my mom and uh, as a result, uh, this was a new, new stage in my life, I was now going into high school, uh, I was now beginning to, girls were beginning to matter, whereas before they, were, they never mattered at all. And uh, so uh, I became exposed to a much larger circle of friends and being in high school and becoming, because due to my age, becoming more and more independent, having my own bicycle and having, being able to get around, uh, meant, that, uh, meant that I was now being exposed to a, to a different world. I think it's, this was, my missile was in 1959, but I think that from the early 60s, the apartheid regime in South Africa had really, uh, had really taken hold. The uh, Stratum was the prime minister at the time, and then after that we went to uh, after the, he was replaced by uh, Dr. Favort and ultimately by uh, John Forster. And uh, these both Favort and Forster were really the architects, the theoretical architects, ideological architects of, of South African apartheid. 
And uh, seeing all this around us was something that, that, um, that was difficult for us to, to appreciate, to acknowledge, to accept. Uh, we kind of all knew that it was wrong, uh, exactly what the alternatives were, I don't know. But uh, as a young person in my early teens, it, it became clear to me that, this, that there were too many injustices in the apartheid system and that there had to be another way and uh, not, uh, not this way. Um, I, and, and I think that my, my actions, was, my thoughts and the feelings were very similar to those of the, of the friends that I, I mixed with. Um, I became active in the, uh, as a young progressive. The Progressive Party at the time was a party that was opposed to apartheid. It was in favor of a peaceful change in South Africa, but it, it took, it took a, you know, I think everybody realized that it was going to take a lot. And, 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 uh, but somehow it, it became clear to us that this, wasn't going, this was a situation that wasn't going to, to, to last indefinitely. Um, by the time I got to, to the trick, to you know, 17 and nearly 18, um, I, it, it then became, that, that was the time that I needed to, to choose not, uh, what I was going to do. I wasn't uh, drafted for the army. Uh, I was given the opportunity to volunteer, which I declined, but uh, I decided at the time that I went through, and unfortunately I think this was, this was a mistake that I made, I, I, didn't, I didn't, the mistake didn't cost me dearly, but uh, what happened was I chose my, my profession and my, my uh, avenue of study based on the process of elimination. I knew I didn't want to be a doctor, I knew I didn't want to be a lawyer, uh, to be a historian wasn't, uh, wasn't a practical thing because it would mean that you would probably wind up teaching and that, that certainly wasn't on my, on my agenda. And uh, ultimately, I, you know, I sort of every, every other alternative would be crossed off the list except being an accountant. So I registered for a BCom degree. I think I was 18 when I got to university. I think uh, looking back, I think that I was too young to really appreciate the value of a university education at the time. Like I said before, I think I underperformed as a student, but you know, I got there, ultimately I got there. But I think that what the university did to me is, again, it exposed me to a much wider uh, area of, uh, of, it expanded my social circle significantly. I became active in the, so in the Students' Jewish Association, and at that time I sort of encountered uh, my identity crisis uh, at the time. I wasn't quite sure whether I was Jewish South African or whether I was a South African Jew. Uh, the question is whether my Judaism was the prime focal point of my uh, identity or whether being a South African was. And uh, the truth is that although my dad had served in World War II and uh, World War II had remained something entrenched in the in the family vibe, I, it never really meant that much. I was never really able to identify in, in a serious way with South Africa. Its history wasn't my history. And I, so, so the, the Jewish element of my, uh, of my identity was a, lot, was a lot more important to me. It, it, it resonated much better with, uh, with my thinking. Um, it was interesting because I would have to recall the countless uh, uh, and endless discussions I would have with my friends and with everybody else, my parents, my brother, on all these issues. And uh, although I sort of I, I went for this much bigger than, than the rest of them did, uh, it, it 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 certainly resonated with me and and, and uh, it took me to a much greater level. Of, uh, of identification with my, with my Yiddishkeit and with, uh, with everything about it. Around that time, I also began to ask myself all the other personal existentialist issues about, you know, is there a God and, and all the rest. To me, it had always been obvious, although I never felt the need to be able to prove this to myself. I didn't need, uh, you know, I wasn't a scientist by by nature or by inclination, so I didn't feel the need to, to, to prove this conclusively to myself. For me it was obvious. It was obvious the, which God I wanted to identify with. And uh, gradually I started getting more and more involved. I started uh, enhancing my levels of, uh, of, of observing 
uh, Judaism. And uh, I actually found it was pretty it was good because it, it also helped me resolve and address a lot of the ethical issues and moral issues that I was having vis-a-vis -vis apartheid, vis-a-vis -vis all sorts of other things that were going on around me at the time. And so uh, my Jewish identity was very important to me. It remains very important to me. And Jewish continuity is, in fact, one of the one of the things that, that I find myself involved in and, uh, uh, you know, significantly. Were there any individuals or books or, or people that impacted on the, the, the thinking, development of that thinking? At that particular time, I don't think there were, there were individuals who really did it. There were, there were people who perhaps had the charisma uh, to, 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 to bring it out a little more in me. But I think that, uh, you know, the, the sort of the ideological people who I think had an effect on me uh, in the longer term were people who were around when I was in my uh, early, in my late teens, early twenties. Um, and that I became exposed to it around that time. Uh, as I mentioned, I was a, uh, I became active in the Students' Jewish Association at the university. I was ultimately elected to the position of chairman at the, at, of the SJA on the university campus. Uh, it's interesting to note that uh, as Jews we made up at the time just over 10% of the students on campus, which was a significant number. And the Students' Jewish Association was accredited at the time as being the largest single organization and most active organization on campus. I think things have changed somewhat since then, but that's what it was like at the time. It was a very, very uh, active organization. We had uh, lots of uh, students from uh, elsewhere in South Africa, from Zimbabwe, from country areas who were studying at, at uh, university. We had a very active center and everything. And, uh, at the, uh, halfway through my term of office, I was selected to uh, come and, uh, and join the, uh, the uh, youth leadership course in Israel. Um, and uh, I spent six and a half uh, weeks in Israel, shortly after the Six Day War. Uh, was this was first? a very special time. This was the first time I've been in Israel. And uh, I was obviously a very impressionable age at that time. And uh, so everything meant a lot to me. It was all very important to me. Everything spoke to me. There was all well, the music with my music and uh, the vibes with my vibes. And uh, it made a huge, huge impact on me. Uh, the one thing I should mention actually was the Six Day War. That was a, a single event that had an enormous um, impact on my identity, on my identity uh, struggle. It, uh, what it meant for me was that I became uh, very much involved in what was happening. There was all the talk leading up to the Six Day War, uh, only 20 years after the, just over 20 years after the Holocaust and six million Jews having been killed. The, the stories were that Israel was about to be obliterated. So with the Six with the Six-Day War uh, approaching, and when the when the war ultimately broke out, there was this uh, this massive fear because there was a, a news blackout uh, in the media. We didn't have television. We the, the radio contact was, was, was at the time was uh, negligible, and uh, we had understood that Israel was uh, was you know was about to be obliterated. And uh, my first, and I think the feeling of a lot of young Jewish people at the time. The feelings were that we needed to be there for the country that was important to us and uh, that we needed to go as volunteers. I remember going on my own one morning directly from the campus to the uh, offices of Western Province Zionist Council on the Forshaw in Cape Town, registering as a volunteer and then coming home uh, and uh, telling my mom that I'd just been there to, to do this. My mother freaked out completely, you know, what was her son? going to give up his final year of university when he had uh, the whole world at his feet you know, and, and uh, what, what was he doing, what was he going to do all this to give it up, you know, for, 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 for Israel. Uh, to me it was very important and, uh, but anyway, my mom, my mom freaked out completely. She called my dad, my dad came back from, from work early and 
but the idea was that he come along and talk some sense to me, but into me. But uh, what happened was that uh, he walked in, <laughs> he came up to me, gave me a big hug, said to me, "Son, I'm really proud of you." And that was a very special moment for me. <laughs> I think ultimately my mother came to grips with the, with the idea that what happened was that the day or two before I was supposed to leave, uh, my dad was admitted to, to a hospital with a, an eye problem. And because of the sensitivity of his sight and everything, he had to undergo an operation. And I felt that, uh, you know, I was torn between the two, but I felt that I needed to be home at that time. As a result, I stayed on in Cape Town. I finished my studies, but towards the end of that year, I was elected as the chairman of the uh, Swedish Association, and I was then ultimately uh, selected to come on the youth leadership course, which I did. It was a couple of months after the Six Day War. It was a very special time uh, in Israel. Um, I, I remember going uh, the first morning after we'd arrived in Israel. We arrived late at night. Following morning, going off to the from the Machon where we were in Katamon, and going to uh, going to Shacharit, going to Daven Shacharit at the at the Kotel, and uh, taking my uh, my kfirin with me in, in the dark and everything because everybody said you have to be there when 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 it's when daylight first hits, and this was a, it was an incredible experience and being able to go around Israel to to tour and to see all the places was really very, very special. And we were caught up in, I was certainly got caught up in all of this euphoria. Ultimately, I came back to Cape Town, became uh, you know, a serious leader in the Zionist youth movement, particularly at the university. Uh, at the time, I think uh, we, the rest of the student body, the liberal student body at the University of Cape Town saw Israel and saw us in an extremely positive light. And uh, we, were, uh, we were given lots of, uh, of exposure on the campus. Uh, and uh, those days were really very, very special. And um, by the time we got, uh, I graduated at the end of 68. I met uh, Phyllis uh, shortly after that, or around that time. In fact, we both graduated at the same ceremony. And I'll never forget, I have a picture on us taken on the steps of, of Jamison Hall, both with being kept and uh, with our parents. And uh, me ultimately, and uh, you know, my parents I'm sure have stood on the steps there overlooking this beautiful view overlooking Cape Town, thinking to themselves, wow, this is, you know, they've got all these wonderful uh, uh, dreams for their, for their son, the first green in history ever to, to graduate uh, from the university. And uh, I must admit, I stood there on the steps. I had my own ideas. I knew where I wanted to go. And uh, in many respects, I also, I, I, I sort of felt that I had a kind of what a hollow feeling is what I recall, because I thought to myself, I've been at university for a couple of years. I've learned economics, business administration, accounting, and all the rest. I, didn't, I, didn't, I wasn't really sure what I'd come away with. I didn't come away with a profession. I didn't, I'd come away with, a, with some knowledge. But uh, unfortunately, I think that I finished it. I spent my days at university uh, at too young an age. I, I don't think I was sufficiently mature to fully appreciate exactly what it was all about. Did you just share this with your parents? That your, Not at the it, time, but after, really... afterwards I certainly did. Afterwards I certainly did share it with them. They, they felt that it was, um, that, you know, that, uh, that this was just the start and that you go out and you get a job and you've got all this, this uh, background knowledge and that in the long run it does serve you, which they were right. Yeah, I think that it did. But uh, I uh, certainly, um, I, I did subsequently have an opportunity to do a course in Israel at the business school at, at Tel Aviv University. It was a special course for, uh, non-degree non course, but it was a special course for people, almost, almost like a refresher course, intended mainly for people who had been in the army, uh, who had been officers in the army, and this was to prepare them for civilian life. And uh, so most of the, my fellow students in that course were, were those kind of people, but that's when I really enjoyed the studies, and that's when I saw that having chosen my profession by elimination actually worked out to be not such a bad thing after all, because I think that ultimately it was a profession that, uh, that paid off.
What did Phyllis study and tell us how you met? Phyllis uh, studied, Phyllis did a BA in psychology and sociology. Uh, we met on the campus, we met actually at the Students' Jewish Association. And uh, I must say that when I came back from Israel, when I came back from Israel in 1967, I thought to myself, well, you know, now I need to plan for my Aliyah and I need to do this thing, uh, you know, sensibly and all that sort of thing. I figured that uh, I needed, uh, that my partner for this uh, thing needed to be a, uh, to help realize this dream, also needed to be a South African because we needed to, I figured that we both needed to come from, to have come from similar backgrounds and all that sort of thing. So being the sort of very regimented and logical person that I am, I kind of prepared what was, I suppose, almost like a job description. Uh, of what uh, of the qualities that I was uh, that I was looking for, and uh, so it was important to me to to meet somebody to you know to develop a, a more serious relationship to get married and then to come to Israel and to to raise a family, which is what ultimately happened. Uh, I came back from Israel in, uh, as a volunt as a uh, as a graduate of the student leadership course at, in uh, January '68. Uh, we graduated at the end of 68, in, uh, we were married at the end of 69, and in June 1970 we left South Africa to come to Israel. And uh, before we came there was a lot of pressure, from, uh, particularly from my mom, my, from my dad less. Uh, I think it was very difficult for them to come to terms with that. At the time, overseas travel wasn't as developed as it is today. Uh, people, people traveled there. So it wasn't, uh, and, and I don't think that they saw themselves as being able to, to ultimately follow us. And of course, my brother was in South Africa, and he was, he was just finishing high school at the time. So um, as a result, uh, I came to, uh, you know, we, we, we came to Israel. I think it was difficult for them at the time, and uh, we basically we started our married life in Israel, and that was also the time when I began my professional life. I had worked for, I worked in 1969 until May 70. I had worked in South Africa as a company secretary for a building company. But uh, to be per per perfectly frank, that was a job that was intended to generate some cash. And it wasn't, I didn't see that as the number, as step one in my professional career that uh, came in Israel. Uh, on the way to Israel, we traveled through Europe. We spent 75 days uh, going through Europe, enjoying what we did. And then we came to Merkaz Klita in uh, Netanya, Ben Yehuda Ulpan in Netanya. We were there for five months. And uh, that was also a very, very interesting area, uh, era. I, my, um, I, I took to, to the language. I actually found it relatively easy. I was put in a Middle, middle class. Well, was having graduated from Herzliya was in a, in a higher class than I was, but uh, I, I really found the Hebrew relatively easy to come to, to grips with, and uh, I was having a great time. If all the people around me were older, uh, on the Ulpan were older than I was, <coughs> and the one thing that occur occurred to me was how concerned these people were about getting jobs and all that. And, it just didn't enter my mind. I didn't, uh, didn't kind of figure that I needed to do this or anything like that. I thought that it, you know, these things would work out when the time came. But what ultimately happened was about, and Phyllis actually was pregnant with our first child at the time, and uh, this was sometime during December uh, of 1970. My... Uh, uh, Phyllis was going to give birth around the 10th or the 8th or the 10th of January, and uh, we had to be out of the little pun by the end of January, and then I need to get myself a job. And I remember coming home from the from the class, from classes one morning, coming back to our apartment, and uh, being faced with the uh, all of a sudden just being hit with a ton of bricks, where, with the thought that you know in. Um, in three weeks' time, I'm going to become a father. I don't have a place where to live. My wife can't work, and I need to get a job. And uh, it it uh, it hit me really like a ton of bricks. But within within a day or two, I had sort of you know pulled myself together. I uh, arranged to get an apartment in Tel Aviv from Amida, which was a government housing company. 
uh, I'll never forget going to this office in Tel Aviv and uh, the being offered this apartment, which was on the outskirts of Bnei Brak, and uh, responding, and, you know, they told me this was a three-room three apartment, uh, two bedrooms and a, and a small lounge. I thought to myself, what have I got to lose? Uh, you know, we'll just take it. So she said, well, I'll give you the key and you can go there, have a look at it and come back. I said, no, yeah, I don't have a car or anything like that and I need to get back to, I need to get back to the Mapasquita to my wife. So I'm ready to sign for it now. And that's exactly what I did. A day or two later, I went to Tel Aviv. I bought all my electrical appliances. I bought all my furniture uh, for the apartment and everything. I did it all on my own. Uh, two weeks later, two, three weeks later, Chaim, my first child, was born. Uh, and uh, at the same time, I went, started going to interviews for jobs. Everything was sorted out. We moved on January 31st. On, uh, and on the 8th of February, I began work at the Israel Aircraft Industry. So all th everything worked out very, very quickly. And it was amazing that uh, just uh, about 14 months, less than 14 months after we got married, that I was already a parent. I was, uh, had my own job. I had a rented apartment with my own furniture, my own appliances. And how all this had come together so quickly, I'm not quite sure how it happened. But, uh, and I, I wasn't 25 years old yet, <laughs> so that to me was uh, was something that was uh, they, that, they were very special times. times. So uh, initially we lived in this uh, small apartment, this small three-room apartment on the outskirts of Bnei Brak, and I began. Uh, the apartment itself was very small. Phyllis was there at home with the uh, with uh, Chaim, and. Uh, I began work at uh, at Tasia Berit Israel Aircraft Industries in February 1971. Uh, at the time, I wasn't altogether sure exactly how much my English was going to to help me. Everybody said there's a huge advantage, but I couldn't quite figure out what the advantage was. And uh, in fact, I remember the uh, the people where the department in which I worked, I was uh, absorbed into uh, the, what they call the infantry accounting department in the headquarters of uh, Israel Aircraft. And uh, I was given some one particular area, one particular type of account to start analyzing. And uh, they, you know, like a typical Israeli style, this thing was just kind of dumped on my desk and you know, the instruction, do it. And I looked at it and I didn't quite understand what it was all about. And I remember going to uh, my boss and uh, asking him to explain to me, give me a bit of a background explanation. And uh, he explained to me everything in Ivrit. He told me it was too difficult for him to do it in English. And I tried to, to follow what he was saying, but it, wasn't, uh, it didn't make all that much sense to me. Anyway, I carried on battling away on my own. And then uh, shortly after that, I, went, I found myself with no choice but to going back to him and asking him to please do his best and explain to me in English because I was having difficulty in understanding. By the time he'd finished explaining to me in English and in Hebrew, I realized that he didn't understand what it was all about himself. But uh, ultimately, I managed to, to uh, through perseverance, I was able to find out what it, what it was all about and, and how to handle it. And I got a good handle on what I was doing. And uh, in fact, the one thing that I did find that uh, I found that I was particular. I, I realized at the time that I was blessed with a good work, work ethic, mm -hmm. far superior to those around me. And I think that what I lacked in formal knowledge and uh, the language issues and things like that, I was able to overcome them just through, through plain hard work and, and perseverance. Uh, we remained on in this apartment in, uh, in the neighborhood for about a year. And then we had the opportunity of buying an apartment in Perak Tikva with, uh, with a pretty big mortgage, which we took at the time. And uh, so uh, we now moved into our own home, and, uh, which I own now. And uh, again, I wasn't yet 26. And so for me, this was a huge, a huge, uh, uh, you know, it gave me a lot of feeling of self-satisfaction in that I was beginning to you know, to get my life together. It was, um, I had a, you know, I was happily married, I had a lovely young child, I was talented in the world, and, uh, and uh, friends that we were busy making, good job, lots of opportunity, and just all in all, very, very happy, and still living in the post-six-day war euphoria 
which of course uh, came to a very abrupt end in, in 1973 with the outbreak of the uh, Yom Kippur War. Uh, I hadn't been, I hadn't yet done my basic military training, so uh, I was still remained, I remained on at work during those times. Uh, it was very, very difficult because everybody else, all my, all my colleagues were, were drafted into the army, who were extremely short-staffed, and I was busy working around the clock uh, in order to, to, uh, to, you know, to, to keep the work up to date. Uh, Phyllis was pregnant with our second child at the time, and uh, the war broke out in October 73. Dora was born in March 74, and uh, so I was still extremely wrapped up in, in trying to do things with my career. And the truth is that, that having to bring up the kids and everything was something that fell very squarely on Phyllis's shoulders. And uh, thank God she's always been a fantastic mother and, uh, and a wonderful and supporting wife. And that's, that enabled me to succeed where I needed to succeed and able to, her, she able to get her satisfaction in providing all these uh, complementary and supplementary uh, functions uh, for the family. Did you feel in, in 73 like an existential threat to Israel? Uh, not really. Uh, whether that was altogether realistic or justified, I'm not sure. But I do remember being at, at Shul on, on, uh, in the afternoon, hearing the air raid sirens, not taking the air raid sirens particularly seriously. But uh, I do remember running from the seventh floor down to the, to the air raid shelters a couple of times uh, at night. Uh, and uh, it, 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 was, it was a very unsettling time and I think that in the, especially in the period, uh, you know, as the weeks and the months elapsed and the number of casualties just kept on growing and growing and growing and things looked extremely bleak, it was, uh, it was certainly, it, it, it did a lot to unnerve us and uh, it, 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 it made us, it, it made me anyway very, uh, I understood that I needed to be vigilant uh, as far as as far as security issues are concerned, and I think that uh, personally you know, or for the country. For the country, I think that it, it became it became clear to me that uh, you know that we needed to, to take care of ourselves. We live in a in a difficult neighbourhood, in a hostile neighbourhood, and uh, one in which um, you know your your uh, at the best. Your uh, neighbours will only respect you for as long as you're strong. For as long as you're not strong, unfortunately, they're not going to uh, they're not going to acquiesce and uh, and you know let you let you live out your 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 Zionist dream in your own in your own leisure. Uh, like I said earlier, the um, yeah, Dvorah was born in 1974, and uh, so uh, you know. Uh, Phyllis was at home bringing up these kids, and uh, Aliza came along in 1977. Uh, shortly after she was born, she was uh, diagnosed as having a serious uh, liver issue. Um, at the, initially, it was uh, suspected as, as cancer, and uh, you know this obviously came as a huge knock to us. She was uh, admitted to, to hospital. She was uh, told. We were told she needed to be operated on so that, that she could be properly uh, diagnosed and uh, they, they uh, performed the operation and I remember the doctor, a doctor coming out of the operation and saying to us, he's calling me aside and saying, you know, listen, the situation is not good and you, you need to prepare your family. And of course this came as an enormous blow to us. Um, but uh, thank God there was another doctor on the staff who said, you know, we'll treat her with cortisone. The initial bi uh, biopsy that they conducted during the operation uh, showed that it wasn't cancerous, but they needed to verify this through a more significant, more, more, uh, more serious uh, biopsy examination in, in Jerusalem. She was newly born, was she? She was newly born, she was three months old. And a very good friend of mine was a doctor at Tel Shomer, and he was, you know, sitting there at the hospital together with us. He said to me, you know, forget what, forget about the issues now. What's important is that she needs to recover from this operation. Now, for, we lived very close to the hospital. We lived a five-minute walk from the hospital, Sharon Hospital in Perachtikva. And uh, Sophilus would be there 
from 6 in the morning until midnight breastfeeding Aliza and I would go in the, at night from 12, from midnight until 6 in the morning and I would sit there together with the nurse who sat by the bed because she was in an oxygen tent and uh, on one occasion the nurse fell asleep and uh, Aliza stopped breathing and I ran out to call the doctors, they came in, they just tore the oxygen tent down, shoved this pipe down her throat, you know, thank God, today she's fully recovered, she's a mother of four lovely children, and, uh, but it's something, it was a, for us at the time, it was a very, very difficult period, having to go through this with all the tension, all the anxiety, uh, my parents came from South Africa at the time to be with us for a while, and to help look after the other kids, the bigger kids. It was a very, very, very difficult, very traumatic period um, uh, at the time. And, uh, but uh, nonetheless, thank God, everything worked out, uh, worked out uh, for the best, and uh, we got through it. I think that uh, there, were, there were a number of, ish, number of events that I remember specifically. I remember coming home from work one night, and this was when, after Eliza had already been released and she was back at home, I come in, I open the front door, I go inside, and uh, I see the two, the two elder kids are sleeping, and uh, I come inside, and uh, there's no Phyllis, and there's no Eliza, and then the, and the next minute, uh, the neighbor comes in, and she's, because we didn't have a telephone at the time, in those days you had to wait, had to wait eight years for a telephone. <laughs> And uh, I remember, I remember Phyllis, I remember the neighbor saying to me, don't worry. She's saying, don't worry, it means there's something to worry about. <laughs> and said, Phyllis has taken, uh, Phyllis is in the hospital together with Alisa. There's some issues, she came into her, her immune system is very, is very poor. And she was in contact with a kid who was diagnosed as having, as being uh, uh, with chickenpox. So they've had to, they're doing a blood transfusion. So she says to me, you go off to the hospital, I'll, take, I'll look after the other kids. I went off to the hospital, I arrive at the hospital, and I see in the, in the, framework, of the, the framework of the door, Aliza is there in a brace, they couldn't find a vein in which to in the, inject the, in which to, to perform the blood transfusion. They had to drain all the blood and then give her a full transfusion. And uh, this, uh, you know, to see all this and to, to witness it was really, was really, really difficult. But uh, thank God, I remember as a kid when they would, uh, when she would be lying in the ward uh, with this huge inflated stomach, and they would, uh, the doctors would used a pen to draw a grid on her stomach, with measuring the, the the spaces between the grid, and every day they would measure these spaces again to see whether it was contracting or whether it was expanding, and uh, you know, going through all of this by the time. By the time we finally, you know, it, by the time it was finally behind us, and uh, when uh, I'm still, I'm still would have liked to have more kids. <laughs> so I think it was too much for Phyllis at the time. How long did that whole process take? The whole process took maybe uh, three, four years. Wow. But, uh, it was it was a long, long, laborious uh, procedure because of the heavy doses of cortisone that she took. It, it, it uh, you know, it, aff it affected everything. And she couldn't go to gun initially like everybody else. It didn't seem to inhibit her afterwards. She was a very outgoing person. But uh, at the time, it was very, very tough. And, uh, it, it was difficult. It wasn't easy. So you worked at Gould Electronics and for a few years? I worked at Gould Electronics for five years until such until they, until following the cancellation of the Lavi project they decided to, to transfer the activity to a local producer and uh, so we were we were out of work. And uh, at that time I began I started a company, a software development company called Executive Computer Systems together with a friend who worked with me at, uh, at Gould and uh, we started developing a business planning system which was going to run on, on uh, PCs. We got a grant from the Ministry of uh, Trade and Commerce from the Office of the Chief Scientist. Uh, we were able to develop the, project, the product, we were able to get it packaged and everything. We did a market survey in the UK 
which was extremely promising. And of course, we then went to the UK to, to start marketing this project. And I was there on my own. Um, having to, uh, I was commuting basically. Initially, I started doing it every week. But then that became too much. I just couldn't, couldn't physically, I couldn't do it anymore. So I started doing it every three weeks. I would come home there for every third weekend for a long weekend and then go back there for two and a half weeks. It was a very difficult period. <coughs> Unfortunately, we weren't successful in finding a, uh, a good distributor. Everybody was happy to become a distributor, but their work ethic and the work ethic that I was, was ready to, to put in were two different things. And, Although we sold, we, we, in the end we got to close to 500 installations of the, of the product, we were just, uh, you know, we were basically having to do all these things ourselves. And uh, we had an opportunity at one stage to be acquired, which uh, my partner and an investor thought wasn't enough, wasn't enough money. I was ready to take it and run right, because I'd had enough of, of uh, being outside of, uh, you know, being in the UK and, and all this commuting business. Anyway, in the end, uh, it, it just it, it became too much for us, and uh, it, it was unfortunate. We we did the we did the market uh, we did the market research. We did everything. Everything was extremely positive, but at the end of the day, it's uh, it's the actual orders that count and the, and, the, and the money that you can generate. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, I learned a, a huge amount. I got an enormous amount of experience in, in sales, in marketing, in uh, product design. In, things like that, things that I didn't have before, raising money and, and things like that. But I got to the stage where it, it, was, it had just become, it just become too much and um, that was perhaps the, the best university education or best non-university education that I had. And ultimately, uh, I came back, uh, I quit that in, in 94 after, after five years, when well, 97. Uh, after after five years or so, in eight years, sorry, after eight years in this uh, in this uh, venture, it was it was just it was just too much. And uh, I came back to Israel. I imagined that people would be queuing up at the airport waiting to, to offer me a job. That didn't happen. It took me quite a few months to find something. And uh, then I got a job ultimately as the uh, chief financial officer. In a medical device, international medical device company, and that was that was really the, you know, that was where I was able to cash in on all the knowledge that I'd uh, that I'd accumulated, all the experience that I'd, I'd accumulated. So uh, Chaim got married in '95. Uh, he got married to Ronit. They've been uh, they've been in school together, and they were childhood and, and childhood classmates. And, and, uh, and friends, and Dvora got married in uh, 96 uh, to Ohad. Uh, and uh, in that time, that was the time that I was still uh, commuting to, to the UK. And then, of course, when the first grandchild was on the way, the prospect of not being at home was one of the, uh, was one of the uh, uh, catalysts that made me think a little more seriously about giving up this, uh, this uh, uh, my venture in the UK and coming uh, and, and, uh, and calling it a day. Um, in retrospect, I should have done that maybe two, three years earlier. But uh, nevertheless, it was, a, it was a good experience. I learned a lot. And uh, if that was the only price, only the, the only uh, bad decision I made <laughs> during my life, then I, then I think that I did okay. Um, Eliza got married in, uh, in 98. And uh, so, uh, all in all, it would, you know, those were also very eventful years for, for us. Our uh, children have given us a lot of pleasure. Uh, we're very fortunate in that uh, two of my kids live here in the same neighborhood together with us in El Kana, which is for us special. Uh, Chaim lives in Perak Tikva, which is only a short uh, drive away. We see each other regularly, the kids, I suppose just like my brother and I, when we say we, we're very similar, that we're very different and we're very close, it applies to all three of them. And I think that, uh, that our kids, uh, together with us and their children, who've come along since, have really uh, put it all together and made, uh, made our lives very, very rewarding and uh, 
we feel very, very blessed that we are able to reflect uh, back uh, on uh, having built uh, such a closely knit uh, family unit. Um, I, uh, I began work at, uh, at uh, Ogamed, which is a multinational, an international um, medical device company, an Israeli startup with a, that had developed a special technology to treat uh, BPH. Uh, I became involved with them at the end of '97, following my return from the UK. And uh, I must say that that too was a, was a tremendous job. It, everything began to develop nicely. The, we opened a, uh, uh, an entity in the United States. We began attracting venture capital from uh, US capital funds, uh, venture capital funds, which went very well, as well as European funds. Uh, and ultimately, the, uh, the headquarters was re were relocated from here to first in New Jersey and then afterwards to, uh, to North Carolina. And uh, then at some stage, uh, the investors decided that it was time for the company to go public. And we were going to go public at the uh, New Stock Exchange in, in Zurich. Uh, this was uh, my exit. Was, this, it was supposed to happen. And uh, but unfortunately, on September 11, 2001, was the uh, terrible attack on the uh, Twin Towers in the, in the US. Uh, I was in America at the time, but uh, that really, it, it knocked the bottom, took the, the carpet away from under the feet of the economy. The investment bank, uh, we were talking about a flotation in the north of $200 million, uh, which I had 1% of the company, uh, that ultimately never never happened. It had to be delayed, and it was delayed again. And by that time, the uh, the founders started fighting with the investors, and the investors decided that they wanted out. The company was ultimately acquired for a relatively insignificant amount of money, and uh, what that meant was that I was out of a job, and I needed to look for something else. I was fortunate this time in that I didn't have to wait any any time at all. I got a job immediately with a wireless, a wireless video company in Farsaba. Again, as the CFO, this also enabled me to travel a fair amount to uh, California, to Silicon Valley, where we had our US entity, and also to the Far East. I was in Korea. I was in, uh, in um, Taiwan and in Japan. So I really have I've had the opportunity of uh, traveling to many different countries and doing all these things. This company ultimately uh, folded in 2006 after having successfully developed its prototype. By that time, the television companies decided that they were looking to decrease the prices of television sets and not to increase them. And therefore, they figured that uh, since they'd found other, technolo other video technologies, and therefore there was no big deal in uh, wireless video anymore. Uh, I was uh, 60 years old at the time. And uh, with the idea of uh, needing to carry on working until I was around 67. And uh, so I was a bit concerned at the time. And, you know, I would have liked that job to have carried on for another couple of years and uh, taken me closer to retirement age. That wasn't to be. I was offered another job. But, um, uh, and I'd actually accepted the job. But uh, in nearer the time, I'd, uh, something about I, I, I didn't particularly like the uh, the person who had uh, recruited me, the CEO of this uh, public company here in Israel, and I decided that uh, instead of going into this job and, and uh, at, at that age, I didn't want to spend uh, the last few years of my professional career um, in an in an environment that I didn't feel comfortable in. So I decided to start uh, operating as an independent financial consultant. I would take jobs on, on a project basis. I uh, served as a part-time CFO in a number of companies simultaneously, as well as handling, handling certain things on behalf of uh, American investors here in Israel. And that really took me through until, until, um, until I got to, to retirement age. Um, 
as far as the family is concerned, that was uh, special because uh, they all started, all three of them were married within, uh, within about four years of one another, three, four years of one another. And uh, ultimately what happened was that it enabled us, the, the, which meant that they also started to bring children uh, around the same time. So um, Chaim has got, uh, him and his wife have two children, Devorah has seven children, and Eliza has four children. Thirteen grandchildren is really special. Getting together is, a, is an experience, especially on Pesach and on, on Chagim and, and being together as a family. Um, the, my eldest grandson is 18 years old, uh, and uh, the youngest one is, is, isn't a year yet. So being being in such a situation is really is really very special, and of course having them so close to us uh, is is important. Um, you see them very regularly. We see them regularly, yes, uh, because my two girls are here in El Cana, uh, and which means that eleven of the grandchildren are not very close at hand. We see them regularly, uh, and of course even the Chaim Chaim comes to visit us at least once a week, and we see him regularly because we're both uh, involved uh, professionally. We're both in the same. Uh, we're both from the same stable. We consult a lot together, so I talk to him just about every day, and uh, we have a very nice uh, uh, relationship, which isn't just a father-son relationship, it's also a friendly relationship, we also confide in one another, and I think the fact that uh, you know, we're able to share uh, professional experiences together has also been a, a, a significant advantage for, for both of us. And your father-in-law came to live with you? When? My father-in-law came to live with us uh, around three years ago. He had, uh, he had a, he's now 96. He had a, uh, a prostate problem which required surgery uh, a couple of years ago. And uh, when he, after the surgery, he came to us to recuperate. And uh, but by that time, anyway, I think he was he was just too, too old to to really be taking care of himself. So he came here and uh, he's been a very welcome addition to our inner family circles. It's been very special to have around here. Yeah. Um, and the Harris said your parents have, they eventually, they did move to Israel, is that right? No. Uh, my, my dad passed away in 1982. Uh, they were still in South Africa at the time. Yeah. I was uh, in the army at the time. It was during the, uh, shortly after the outbreak of the uh, Lebanese, first Lebanese war. Um, I knew my dad was in hospital and uh, so being here and not being there was difficult but due to the circumstance at the time, I couldn't travel to South Africa. Um, ultimately, uh, we decided not to tell them that I was in the army, that I'd been drafted, but uh, ultimately they, they found out. And uh, I remember, you know, sort of trying to explain to them why I thought it was in everybody's interest that they never knew at the time. But uh, anyway, my dad unfortunately didn't recover. He passed away at the time. And uh, both my brother and I traveled to South Africa to be there for the burial and for the, for the shiva and everything, which in itself was an amazing experience because so many people, so many friends, uh, came out of the sort of just seemed to come out of the woodwork, and uh, it was it was amazing how many people showed up at the house, people that my dad had been with uh, in the army, school friends of his, uh, other friends that you know, other people in their circle of friends, uh, whites, non-whites that he worked with, uh, customers, all sorts of things like that. My dad was very highly thought of, so being able to experience that shiva and so many people coming to, to comfort us as mourners was, uh, was a very special time for us. My mom uh, made Aliyah three years later in 1985. Um, she lived here for a total of six years uh, until she passed away. Unfortunately, she got cancer and that just, uh, that just really took it out of her. But, uh, she was uh, she was reduced to 28 kilos towards the end. She died during the Gulf War in our house. 
and uh, it was a very also a very difficult, very traumatic period. But it was, uh, you know, I think that she was. It was a wonderful. In many respects, it was a wonderful experience for her being in this house at the time of the of the Gulf War, because it, it amazed her that whenever the, the air raid sirens would go off, and immediately, you know, to be followed by the all clear, the way the telephone would start ringing, and everybody was so was so concerned about everybody else's welfare. This meant a lot to her, but unfortunately, she really suffered uh, towards the end and. Uh, but she knew your children. She had. A, she, she knew. She knew my children. Yes, yeah, she knew all three of them. Uh, my dad knew two of them. My dad also knew all three of them. Uh, but uh, my mom knew them. Uh, Alisa, being the youngest, was uh, 14 when my mom passed away. Unfortunately, they uh, they never knew their their grandchildren or their great grandchildren. Great -grandchildren. But I think that uh, them knowing their, their grandchildren was, was a wonderful experience for them. For their great-grandchildren, I can, that's the one thing that I regret, that they, haven't, that they didn't have the opportunity of seeing them. Uh, and I say that knowing the sacrifice that they made as parents in wanting to give us as many opportunities as possible. And uh, when I think back, how many opportunities I had and that perhaps I wasted, but they were always there to make sure there were more uh, opportunities. And um, I think that if I could ask for anything, the greatest thing that I could that I could want <laughs> is for my is for my parents to have the opportunity to engage with their and children, it would have been um, something that would be very special for them. Do you see this film as a way of engaging with your future generations? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so I know what my, my children, my grandchildren have given me, are giving me, and um, I'd like to be able for them to be able to, to share what what, uh, what they had with me and what I have with them to pass it on to their generations as well. So that would, that would certainly be a, a big plus and one of the things that perhaps motivated the, uh, this movie. Uh, in the early 1980s, we decided that we wanted to, to upgrade our, from our apartment in Pedach Tikva. And uh, we had the opportunity of coming out to, to El Cana, which uh, I had a friend from work who lived here, and uh, he was part of the original group that helped found uh, this particular settlement. And uh, so we decided that uh, this, was, uh, this was a good alternative for us. The, uh, the fact that we were, the, the house, to build the house would have cost us the same way, but we built it. But uh, the land, at least, was, uh, was cheaper here. Yeah. And uh, so we were fortunate enough to get a plot at the time. And we started building in 1984, first night of Hanukkah. We moved to Seattle, to, uh, to Elkanah. So we've been here now for just over 30 years. Uh, it's been a fantastic experience for us. It was a great place for the kids to grow up, all as teenagers and, and uh, beyond that. And uh, that's why having being able to have two kids living here still today is particularly rewarding for us. We made ourselves a very wide circle of friends over here. Most of the people here, certainly in our neighborhood, are our age, our contemporaries. <coughs> we share lots of things together, and uh, these are the people who, I suppose, together helped uh, me to fulfill my, uh, my Zionist dream. Um, being here in Elkanah has been a special location, it's, it's very convenient, we've been here to, always been here to work and uh, the, uh, the community here is, is, is really a fantastic community in terms of the, uh, the social network and the, and the support system that it provides to everyone. I know that in the time that I was traveling to and from the UK, it was always very rewarding for me to know that Phyllis was at least in a, in a, living in a community 
who actually had a strong social and, uh, and, uh, and support system. Um, I also had the privilege of serving here on the local council for three years. I was a, a local councillor. Um, so I suppose that's where I got my feet, my feet wet uh, in Israeli politics. Do you want to carry on talking about your other voluntary work or other work that you've done in the community? <coughs> yeah. Um, in my later years, I became uh, active in Telfed, which is the uh, the Israel office of the South African Zionist Federation. Uh, I think uh, immigrant absorption was always something that had been important to me. It was always something that I wanted to be involved in. And uh, when I was able to create uh, enough free windows in my overall program, it seemed to me that uh, that Telford was the became the natural choice of uh, the kind of organisation I wanted to be involved in. Initially, I uh, took part, I was the chairman of the projects committee, Aliyah projects committee, and I was active there for around two to three years until I got I was talked into getting involved in a position which uh, I tried to avoid because I wanted to keep my business and my, um, my, my professional side out of what I was doing on a voluntary basis. That unfortunately didn't work. I wasn't strong enough to resist the pressures and I've taken on the, uh, the I've been the honorary treasurer and now I'm uh, f finishing up a term of eight years, which was uh, a long time, but it's been a very rewarding period and I think that, uh, that it, it's, it's given me a lot and it, it's really made me realize that what people told me beforehand, that the more the more you can give, the more you get back, and it, it's been a, a really a very rewarding period for me. Um, it's, it's wonderful to know that you can be involved in something that is contributing to the benefit and the welfare of others. And uh, that's something that I feel strongly about and something that uh, my decision to become active in Telford is, uh, is vindicated. Um, I've also, uh, I also enjoy my sport very much. I've always been uh, a keen sports person. Uh, in, over the years, I haven't really had all that much opportunity to develop my sporting career to that extent. Not that I think that I had these enormous talents, but uh, what I did do in later years was I became a pretty active uh, lawn bowler. And I've had the uh, opportunity of uh, twice representing Israel at the uh, Maccabi International, Maccabi Australia International Games in Sydney in 2006 and 2010. Uh, we won a bronze medal there in 2010, which was a nice achievement. And then I, on two occasions, I won the qualifying tournaments uh, in Israel to enable me to represent Israel at the World Indoor Bowls competition in, uh, in England in 2013 and 2014. The uh, most significant thing about uh, my appearances there was that I was by far the eldest uh, competitor, but nonetheless it was a wonderful it was a wonderful experience being able to participate in an international event. When I started playing in the in the early 80s, there were we got to, to a situation towards the late 80s, early 90s, where we had about 1,300 bowlers in Israel. Unfortunately, to date, the numbers down to less than 400. But uh, it, and that's it, it's a problem that we need to we need to address. I've been active over the years in various administrative positions in the bowling uh, community. Um, I've also been the tournament organizer uh, for the for the past five years of the uh, Israel Professional Bowlers Association, uh, and uh, I've enjoyed it. It's been it's been a rewarding period for me as well. The uh, coming to, to Israel at the age that I did, uh, being 24 years old, uh, one of the things that I realized that I would have to do at some stage was military training, and I hadn't done military training in South Africa. I was drafted uh, for basic training in 1974. I was, uh, after a shortened uh, basic training, period of basic training, I was taken, I was drafted into the artillery corps where I became a tank driver. 
and I served in that position for a total of 13 years until 1987 when they decided to disband our unit and to, to retrain the younger people on a more modern uh, piece of equipment. At that time I was transferred to a supply unit, a uh, non-combat unit, and I remained on doing active service until uh, I was 51 years old uh, when I retired from the Army at the, at the rank of the Sergeant Major. Can you think of any special uh, events or experiences that you well, had? Well, I think that one of the, one of the unique uh, experiences that we had was uh, being together as uh, an indigenous uh, crew of, of, on our particular tank. Every tank has a crew comprising eight people. I was the driver, there's also there's a, a, and then there are different people on the, on the tank with different, uh, uh, fulfilling different functions. Uh, we were all very different. I was the only academic amongst them. Everybody else was, uh, you know, they were all different people. Some were Israeli born, some were foreign born. Everybody was different. But it was amazing how we were all, as a group, uh, able to, to meet at the same level and to share the same experiences. I think that uh, during the time we spent together during the uh, uh, First Lebanese War, uh, it was it was uh, was was uh, was fantastic in the sense that it enabled us to bind to get to bond together as a unit, and uh, I remember inviting all the guys from my unit to a housewarming when we moved into our house in Al Kana. Everybody came, and, it, and some of them really travelled a long way to get here. It was it was really great. It was a wonderful experience because we felt that although we were so different in the normal world, in the everyday world, we would never have, we'd never have been in touch with one another. We wouldn't have befriended one another or anything. And yet, we became so close. And, uh, and um, you know, even until today, I still give regards and I send regards to different people. I don't see them that often, but it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing, amazing experience that one has. And again, you know, you, you experience uh, danger together it, it, it bonds people. Some years ago, I, uh, I began getting involved in uh, public diplomacy on behalf of Israel. It's, uh, it really upset me the way in which uh, during recent years, um, it seems to me that uh, anti-Semitism is, is, is on the rise, and that's seriously on the rise. I think what internationally. Was internationally, I think a number of years ago, uh, being anti-Semitic or making anti-Semitic statements <coughs> was something that was was very much um, uh, frowned upon. It wasn't politically correct, and people refrained, by and large, refrained from doing it. I think that what's happened, what's developed over the last couple of years, is that all the shame has been thrown out the window. Uh, I'm personally very concerned with the, level, with the double standards that are continually being applied against Israel, the delegitimization, the demonization, I think all with the intention of justifying what could well turn into another Holocaust. I know this may sound dramatic, but that's really the way that I feel about it. Um, it, it prompted me, together with some other colleagues, to set up an organization which we call Truth Be Told, the idea is to, um, to talk about, to, to make people aware of things that are going on in Israel that and, and not, to, not to be suckered in by the uh, continued onslaught of, uh, of propaganda which is directed against Israel. At that point, do you want to talk a little bit about, also about Phyllis's work, her career and her... Yeah. Uh, uh, Phyllis... Uh, at university, she studied psychology and sociology. <coughs> Being a young mother in Israel didn't give her that much opportunity to um, to uh, to uh, develop her career. But um, at some stage, she started teaching English to adults, and then uh, at, at a later stage, she managed a uh, desktop publishing business called Panda Publishing, which we acquired. She ran that office in. Uh, in extremely well in, uh, in Ranana for five years until 
desktop publishing was no longer a business proposition. She then uh, got a position as the coordinator of English studies at the uh, Ariel uh, pre-academic, Ariel University pre-academic program. And uh, most of her students were Ethiopians. I think that what was particularly rewarding for her is that she used to come home, I'll never forget, at the beginning of every academic year and said, this year I've got the poorest, the weakest pre uh, pupils imaginable. And every year she would reach the end of the academic year and these, she, these kids would be prepared for academic studies in English. And I think that there was a major opportunity and I think that she made a huge difference to a lot, a lot of young people, particularly members of the Ethiopian community. Mm. Um, she was in that uh, position for a long time until her voice cocked in completely and uh, so she, she retired about uh, nine years ago. And uh, since then, we, uh, we try to spend as much time as we can, uh, now that I'm retired as well, try and spend as much time as we can walking, being around for our kids, being able to, to travel. <coughs> and uh, we've been fortunate in the sense that we've been able to, to travel to many different places around the world, to New Zealand, to Alaska. Uh, all over the United States, and it's been it's been a wonderful experience. And we're fortunate that both of us enjoy the, uh, the similar things. We both love hiking and walking, and fresh air, and nature. That's those are our holidays, and they're very special times for us. Um, I must say that on a, on a personal level, for this has also been a wonderful. Uh, uh, basis of uh, support for me, so that behind every successful person there stands, so there's, there stands a powerful woman, and in my case, uh, I don't know how successful I've been, but I've had a powerful woman behind me. She's been very special, she's been very supportive, she's an incurable optimist. She's, uh, for her, all the difficulties that we, that we faced, and especially those with Aliza, and, and after that, uh, with her, every, every obstacle has been a challenge. And uh, I think that she's always been a wonderful example to her children uh, and to her own family, because uh, particularly given the way that she's looked after her dad for the past couple of years, very special. It takes a lot for somebody at that age to find the energy and to find the strength to put into looking after him what, what she's done. A lot of people had uh, influenced me uh, significantly during the course of my life. Uh, obviously, my parents at the beginning, and my friends, and uh, my brother, and, and, thing, and people like that, and a closer family. Um, as I began to uh, grow up and mature and, and, and became aware of things that were happening in the world, there were other significant uh, historic people who are today historical figures that I believe also had a significant influence on my life and uh, people who were able to serve as role models for me. Uh, people who uh, intuitively come to mind were those around during the civil rights struggle of the early 60s, uh, particularly uh, Robert Kennedy and of course Martin Luther King. Um, Perhaps the civil rights issues spoke more to me at the time because of the uh, everything, all this was happening, unfolding in the U.S. and people seemed to, the whole movement there seemed to be progressing and achieving something. Whereas in South Africa, the apartheid was becoming more and more bizarre, more uh, more uh, ideological, and a lot more a lot more serious than it had been in the years prior to that. Um, in addition to that, as the Zionism became, began to, to, to take up a, a greater part of my, my passion, I felt that uh, Menachem Begin symbolized for me a, a, a true, what a true Jewish leader was meant to do. I felt that he was a, he, he was really, he was a Yiddish mensch. He, he, he seemed to, to, uh, he seemed to, to have all the values that people wanted at the time. And uh, I was particularly impressed as I learned about uh, the history of Jewish people and the Zionist struggle 
and the War of Independence and everything that became immediately before and immediately after that, I was particularly impressed by, by Begin's ability to see a bigger picture and despite the, the Altalena and, the, uh, and other events, he was able to, to see the bigger picture. He pledged himself to the country, to the, to the wider uh, elements of the movement rather than, than you know, just promote his own uh, political agenda. Uh, ben Gurion, of course, was, uh, you know, was also an ultimate leader. And uh, all in all, uh, these people represented to me uh, major figures and uh, people that I felt that uh, you know, I, I, was happy to, I was happy to follow the, the beacon that they, were, that they were carrying. The people that I, the political figures that I identified with in South Africa at the time, particularly Ellen Sussman and the, and the people who represented the Progressive Party at the time, but they were very small. It was it, it wasn't it wasn't a major thing. And, and the truth is, although we, we realized that the system over there wasn't invincible, it wouldn't last forever. But uh, we sort of think we, our feeling was that the system, the, that system was going to be in place for a long time. And uh, but afterwards, as a former South African, seeing what ultimately unfolded in South Africa. I think uh, it was a great pity that people like Mandela they only, only uh, uh, achieved power or was able to, 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 to rise to power in 1994 at a significantly older age when I think he was probably much too old to actually serve as an effective president or prime minister or leader of government. But um, I certainly admired his ability to you know, to put in the past what belonged in the past, not to not to forgive and not to forget, but at the same time to realise that people had to move forward and they had to move forward together. And uh, so I do obviously admire him, and also admire, admire of course, uh, the clerk for, for his part in this in in the, in the whole um, in this whole um, uh, uh, unfolding of events. But um, these people. It, that was already past me. I can't. I can't say that these people had any significant uh, influence on me. Another person who I think also had an influence on me was uh, the Lubavitch Rebbe, uh, who I felt was also epitomised for me uh, Jewish leadership, uh, a com total commitment to his community, to his people, uh, an example. Uh, somebody who somebody who led by example, not somebody who led by power or or his his authority was a moral authority, and uh, so he also had a had a significant effect on my life. Um, as things go on, you become older, you begin to influence other people's lives. This, that uh, although there were people who came and went, and some people I, I admired, I still feel that you know that that the greats that were around that during my my late teens and, and 20s, these were the people who, who obviously had the most significant and the profound uh, um, effect on my uh, ideological uh, outlook on life. I think that uh, from a personal point of view, one of the famous Midrash has always said a lot to me in terms of, um, in terms of what we should asp be aspiring to do. And uh, the Midrash tells us that every good deed that we, that we do, uh, every time we perform a good deed, we actually acquire another name for ourselves. And it also, the Midrash then goes on to say that every person has three names. The name that's given to him by his parents, and I was given, I was named after my paternal grandfather, so I presume that that encapsulated in some way the dreams that my parents had for me. The second name that you get is the one that you get from the people around you, from your colleagues, your family, or you know, your broader family, your friends. Uh, and the third name is the name that you earn for yourself. Well, the name you earn for yourself is by far the most important thing. Earning a good name takes a lot of work. It's a job that never ends. You know, you've got to be, you've got to be at your best every day. You've got to, you've got to prove yourself to the people that you're coming into contact with. You've got to be, you've got to, you, people know, people mustn't be, shouldn't be surprised by you and your actions. They should be able to read you in such a way that they know that when you say that your word is your word, and you, and you know, if you say something, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna carry it out. Don't make idle threats and, and, and things like that. 
Um, and at the same time, I think a good name is something that can so easily be wasted. One, one mistake, one in bad indiscretion, all the good work that you put in can go down the drain in one go. And I think that uh, knowing that you know, living, living every day as, as if, as if you, you're striving to achieve that goal of earning yourself a good name is, is, a, is a very positive philosophy and one I think that's going to keep you on the right side of the, of the road. And how do you see that in your own perspective? I hope that I've lived up to, I hope that I've lived up to that, uh, to, to, to that, to, to the aims of that uh, midrash, and that I've uh, done, uh, you know, that I'm, I continue to do. I don't see myself as being at the end of the road. Uh, I hope that I've still got a way to go, and I think that I've still got a contribution to make. But uh, I would, I would like to continue doing whatever I can to uh, to serve my my family, to the community. The, my country, my people, in, in such a way that I can bring them credit, and that uh, that people will, people will use that as an example. And I really hope that I can be.